Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. It is so good to see people outside of Zoom boxes, I have to say. Um, on behalf of Spotlight and Poverty and American Policy Ventures and the Doris Duke Foundation, I am delighted to kick off this Hill event today called Family Economic Mobility, Finding Bipartisan Pathways Forward to Support Pro-Family Policies. Just a quick note on Spotlight on Poverty, it is a nonpartisan initiative that brings together diverse perspectives from political, policy, advocacy, and the philanthropy foundation world to find solutions to economic hardship confronting millions of Americans. Spotlight on Poverty does curation, we do content, original content, and convenings like this to have conversations that inform the policy debate. We are honored to welcome Senator Hassan and Senator Cassidy to lead off our conversation today and also want to thank the all-star lineup of panelists that are up here that will be joining us after the conversation. And finally, a very special thank you to our sponsoring partner, the Doris Duke Foundation. I'd like to invite their president, Sam Gill, to say a few words. Um, as let me introduce you, I've had the pleasure of working with Sam um, several years ago when he was a vice president at the Freeman consulting firm. He is now the third president and CEO of the Doris Duke Foundation, which is a national philanthropic organization whose mission is to build a more creative, equitable, and sustainable future by investing in artists and the performing arts, well-being and greater mutual understanding among uh, diverse communities, environmental conservation, and medical research, I think, and child welfare. I think I got them all. Prior to joining Doris Duke, Sam was the Senior Vice President and Chief Program Officer at the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, where he oversaw more than $100 million in annual grant making across the Foundation's programs. So Sam, I'm so glad you could be here today, and I welcome you to the podium. Thank you very much, Shelly. Shelly and I have known each other for 15 years, um, longer than, than I've known my family, because they haven't been alive that, that long. Um, and thank you to Spotlight on Poverty for, for organizing this, and also to American Policy Ventures. And a real special thanks to Senators Cassidy and Hassan, uh, and also uh, Senator Hassan's staff, who've been just incredibly helpful in pulling this event together. Thanks, of course, to our panelists, who I think are going to provide a riveting an important conversation. Thanks to all of you for being here. These are really important issues, and it's critical um, that people like you uh, invest your time and your energy um, and, and your intellectual metal uh, in these in these challenges because they're real and significant, but they are soluble, and they're going to be made soluble through your through your efforts. I just want to talk very briefly about uh, Doris Duke Foundation, kind of who we are, what we do, what we stand for, our work in child well-being, and then just a, a brief reflection on kind of the broader moment that we're that we're in, and that I hope is to some extent at issue today. Um, so as Shelley mentioned, Doris Duke Foundation um, is working to build a more creative, equitable, and sustainable future that's backed by a $2 billion endowment that's invested in a very eclectic range of programs from the performing arts to medical research. We also own and operate two centers that serve the public. One uh, is an environmental stewardship center that's 2,700 acres in New Jersey called Duke Farms. And the other is uh, the only center in the US uh, devoted expressly to Muslim cultures and artistic traditions, which is Shangri-La in, in Honolulu. Um, our attitude at Doris Duke Foundation is that very much that we're, we're pursuing what we think of as a kind of philanthropy of now. Um, we recognize that the world is changing in fundamental ways. Uh, and we're willing to use kind of any tool that we need to address pressing problems with impatience and novelty. Grants are the common tool that we use, but we're trying to be much more creative than that. We think moments like this, for example, are just as important um, as a well-timed a well social investment. Um, we think also that this idea of a philanthropy of now really reflects Doris Duke the person. Um, I, I think of really two words to define Doris Duke. Uh, the first is modern. Uh, she was modern in the technical sense. She was always of the time that she was in, and that was reflected in her artistic tastes, in her clothing tastes, but also in her philanthropy. She was funding Planned Parenthood in the 30s and HBCUs in the 60s and HIV AIDS research in the 80s. That's the kind of person that she was. And she was transgressive, and I don't mean by that that she just broke the rules because she could, but rather she was someone who recognized that when the rules were no longer serving either moral beauty or aesthetic beauty, then it was time to try something different. Um, this is a moment of paradigm change, and I think that's nowhere more evident than in social policy, and so I think we need Doris Duke's modern and transgressive spirit. What are the solutions that are gonna work for today, and what are the solutions that are gonna get us to buck some of the conventions that are holding us, holding us back? 
Our child well-being program, um, which is one of our significant national programs, uh, is focused on preventing cruelty to children. That's what Doris Duke's special interest was. And over the past decade and a half, has invested in a range of specific interventions uh, around child protection, but also addressing the background conditions that make child abuse and neglect uh, more likely and possible, which of course we'll talk a lot about today. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, we welcomed a new program director, Ju Yun Chang, that many of you know. She was the head uh, of child protection in Michigan and also a senior official um, in, the, in the Biden-Harris administration at ACF. Um, and what she has led us to develop is, is really an effort to seize the historic opportunity presented by the Families First and Preventative Services Act. I think those of us who are familiar with the child protection system recognize that the, the, the historic emphasis on funding removal has enabled and created a system that whose logic is focused on removal and is thinking always about to remove or not to remove. And what we want to do is try to change that logic so that the logic of the system is focused on prevention. How do we identify the families who can be on track for better outcomes and reach them with the supports that we need? As you all know, so many families who could benefit from community-based supports just sort of bounce off the system because they don't meet the criteria for, for removal. In the new year, we're going to be announcing a multi-jurisdiction demonstration to see if we can build end-to-end -end with specific populations, something that looks like a prevention system. It'll be a $30 million investment. Uh, it's, that's the largest single investment that we've made in this set of issues. And we're really looking forward to joining with other uh, forward-thinking funders to think about how we can implement FFPSA and, in general, move our human services and social policy system toward a prevention-oriented paradigm. So people like Annie Casey Foundation, Casey Family Services, Aviv, Duke Endowment, Hilton Foundation, Stand Together, Balmer Foundation, Kresge, so many others who have been uh, have been relentless in their investments in this space. Um, let me just conclude with a, a word about the moment that we're in. Um, it does feel, I think, to so many, um, who, not only who walk these halls, but in the, in the country at large, that it's a time when sort of the solutions feel out of reach. Um, some of that has to do with the profound level of polarization in this country. Um, and some of it has to do with just a great degree of disaffection. You know, voters on both sides of the aisle are more and more throwing up their hands, thinking that we just don't have ideas that are commensurate with the complexity, the nature of the challenges that we, that we face. But I think it's also a time of great opportunity. Um, you know, the inability of our major parties to manage coalitions as effectively in the past is a symptom of a broader political realignment that's happening, and that realignment is driven by people wanting to see better responses to the material conditions of prosperity in this country. They want to see different solutions for how to deliver on results that they're just not experiencing. Um, and the reality is that whether you ha adopt a conservative or progressive philosophy about how to address those challenges, there probably is no path forward in policy or in politics where tens of millions of Americans feel that basic prosperity, the most sort of fundamental ingredients of livelihood are out of reach, where the gap between those with the most and the least is as wide as it is today, and where there's a feeling that somehow the game is rigged, that no matter what I do, this thing called the American dream is unattainable for me. And I think these discussions, our demonstration, other efforts like this will help us to find ways to address these issues in ways that feel real and meaningful and responsive. It's going to require taking some risks. It's going to require learning. It's got to require evidence. Politics will be a part of what makes these solutions possible. I think Senators Cassidy and Hassan show commitment to this idea that politics and policy can align in ways that deliver real solutions to the real problems people are facing in a time of profound change. And I hope their colleagues take heed of their commitment to substantive discussions like this. So we are absolutely delighted and proud to be sponsoring this. I can't wait to see the discussion. Before we get to it, though, I have the real honor of um, inviting one of the other co-sponsors to the, to the stage, which is uh, Paolo Mestrangelo, the uh, head of American Policy Ventures, who I think is going to help us uh, kick off the discussion. So Paolo, please. OK, we don't need much introduction. Please join me in welcoming Senator Hassan and Senator Cassidy. OK, 
Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. And while they're coming up, uh, they won't boast much, so I will for them. Uh, the important thing, you know, about them, I think. Oh, here or there? Oh, why don't you sit next to her? I'll, I'll sit. You guys sit next to each other. All right. Um, the the thing about you know this room is probably eighty percent of us that are working on these issues day in and day out, and I think what's often lost is. We, we end up viewing members of Congress and senators as inputs <laughs> or chess pieces uh, instead of real people who have incentives and emotions and life stories that bring them to the table. So in addition to having two of the, from a qualitative and quantitative perspective, the most bipartisan senators in probably a generation, that's great. Uh, there are an important commi committees, also great. Uh, what's critical for these set of issues is they both um, want to work on them and have a deep um, interest and passion for them, and that's uh, what, what gets stuff over the finish line. So, so thank you both for, for being here. Um, I figured in, in the spirit of Sam's words, uh, we could just start by helping the crowd understand sort of on these issues, families, households, children, uh, what drives you, what's going on in your state, uh, what, what are you seeing you know, when you go home, uh, so maybe we can we can we can start there, and we can start with you, Senator Hassan. What what are you seeing in New Hampshire in, in terms of families and what they need? Well, first of all, thank you, Paulo and American Policy Ventures, and to Spotlight on Poverty and the Doris Duke Foundation. Thank you for bringing us all together this morning. Um, I really really appreciate it. Um, look, the, what I'm seeing in New Hampshire, I suspect, isn't very different than what Bill is seeing in Louisiana, which is one of the reasons we're able to work together and one of the things that drives bipartisan work in the Senate and uh, in politics generally. Um, by macro data, the economy has, is recovering, lowest unemployment rate in an awful long time, really good growth, um, lots of exciting things happening. But for families, I continue to hear about the fact that the essentials are too expensive whether it is housing or child care, um, and uh, that people really um, are struggling, uh, especially now with interest rates making, for instance, buying a home more expensive, uh, especially uh, with the cost of child care. So we know we need to do a lot more on housing. We need to do more to help people afford child care. Uh, we need to help the entire child care industry um, get to a point where uh, workers are paid enough, uh, there are enough openings, uh, and families can actually afford uh, to um, pay the child care bill, whether that is through subsidy or the like. I'm on a number of bills uh, that would help us do that. On housing, uh, I am on uh, some bipartisan bills led by Senator Cantwell to just increase our low-income housing tax credit, for instance, uh, get the supply of low- and moderate-income housing up. Uh, I also have some more um, targeted things like uh, making the uh, home mortgage insurance premium d fully deductible on a permanent basis to help those families that can't afford a 20% deposit. So there are a, there's a lot of work going on as we are hearing from constituents about these issues. Uh, and we're also trying to lower costs, for instance, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, help lower energy costs and help uh, lower pharma pharmaceutical costs, right? So uh, that's kind of the nature of the work. Short term, what can we do to help families afford what they need right now? Uh, long term, how can we make uh, the economy generally uh, more inclusive? Uh, and lastly, what drives me um, are a lot of different things, my constituents hearing from them. But you know, at the end of the day, um, my family experience, and I suspect Bill will talk about this too, um, makes it more and more important for me to focus on how do we make life work for people in the United States of America. Um, my husband and I uh, have two great kids. Our oldest has very severe disabilities. So what drew me into this uh, work was advocating for Ben, who has very severe cerebral palsy, uh, among other things that is a more, probably a more long-term um, goal is to make life work um, and make the economy work for families um, from all uh, corners of my state and our country, uh, but a focus on making sure that we're recognizing the challenges, cost, um, and needs of caregiving families. And so that will continue to be some of the work, too. My story is a lot like, uh, boy, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for all. Since you all are stakeholders, thank you for what you all do. Yeah. Uh, this is really a public-private NGO partnership, and thank you for making it work. Um, 
a lot of what I'm about to say will echo what Maggie said. Um, you look around my state, you see incredible need. And you look around my state, you see incredible opportunity. And if you can couple the two, then you actually can use the opportunity to address the need. And, you know, game theory tells us that when everybody does better, we all do well. And so, but when some of us don't do as well, then everybody suffers. And so there's within that a lot of potential examples. My state has one of the highest rates of poverty in the nation. So we just start with that baseline. But even the middle class, and I'm going to echo uh, Maggie, even the middle class, inflation is killing them. Property and casualty insurance, which is a state-based issue and somewhat related to inflation, killing them. Flood insurance, which for, I guess you have a little bit of that on your coast. We have a lot, about, a lot of that. We now have it a lot all over the state. It, yeah. So flo ways. yeah. So flood insurance has become unaffordable, and it doesn't have to be. I mean, there's actually solutions that can address that. Um, uh, so that's kind of the, the table setting. But then you can actually do things that make life better, which is really um, positive reinforcement. Maggie and I spearheaded the No Surprises Act. Uh, and so middle income families would come up and say, listen, I got this bill. I can't believe I got this bill. They're billing me $10,000 for a piece of equipment. Um, and <laughs> I'm chuckling. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and... Um, and so we worked on that. It was intense. It was five committees, two chambers, chairman and ranking members who didn't care for our product, but we were pretty sure it was the best. And finally, we got it through. On average, it's preventing uh, one million surprise medical bills a month. Yeah. Uh, a month. Now, that is tangibly making people's lives better. Um, I'm chuckling because we were at the, uh, we were at the, I think this was the, the East Room, no, the, the, the Cabinet Room. Oh, man, that, that day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 we were so, in the Roosevelt Room in the White House. Roosevelt right? Room. Yeah. And, um, and um, President Trump was all at Kumbaya, and we were right behind the President, and uh, right about then, President Trump starts to rag on something, but it was very partisan. He ragged on Democrats in Puerto Rico, and... Yeah. I kept trying to move myself out of the shot. And, and Maggie's like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, and Bill's kind of helping. He's like, she wants to get out of this shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was, if you ever seen Death of Stalin and uh, you see it uh, where the guy's moving back and forth, now but I'm anyway. Go watch that. All right. <laughs> um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which is like creating infrastructure, is creating jobs, it is um, uh, helping rural communities get access to broadband internet. I could go down the whole list of ways, something that we've worked on bipartisan. Lastly, on energy. I'm a big believer the, the private sector is going to drive us. Government only has so much it can do. Uh, the development of natural gas resources. Um, uh, if you th working class families, non-college educated, traditionally, almost always, uh, good paying jobs in construction, manufacturing, and extraction. Uh, and this is um, uh, jobs in the extraction industry, which is literally fueling a reindustrialization of the United States of America. Uh, which, of course, then causes a lot of construction. And so if our issue is, as was set up, how do we create prosperity for kind of working Americans? Is there any hope? Yeah, there's hope. Yeah. First, you don't subtract by, you know, protecting them from surprise bills, total exploitation. But secondly, you create jobs through the infrastructure bill, for example, which then sets the stage for a natural gas boom, which is, again, lowering lowering um, fuel prices, but literally fueling a reindustrialization. So there is public policy that can do this, and you only get there if you work together. Absolutely. Well, you took half my questions uh, with that. Uh, okay. But so you brought it up. I think it was really important. I think a lot of us, uh, we only want to talk about big ticket items, but you brought up some bills that don't get amplification, don't get the limelight, but are really important. One that I thought was really interesting that I'd love you guys to talk about is the Connected Moms Act, that I think is one that's something that's not getting much airtime but is incredibly important. Um, yeah, so Bill and I are working on this bill. Uh, the Connecting Moms Act is about making sure that um, our Medicaid and Medicare policies uh, actually allow moms 
uh, to get monitored, pregnant women to get monitored uh, during their pregnancies remotely, right? There's plenty of technology out there that can get a mom's blood pressure or sugar levels uh, to her health care provider without her having to lose half a day's work to go in for an appointment uh, if, in fact, she's got the transportation uh, to go in for the appointment. And we know how important uh, maternal health is uh, uh, during pregnancy as well as postpartum. So this is a straightforward thing that just says, hey, we're in the 21st century. Uh, we need to be able uh, to give um, pregnant moms all the uh, tools that they need uh, to take care of themselves, to have better outcomes, to lower costs, um, and to have uh, healthy moms and healthy babies. And that's something that there's great bipartisan commitment to, and it gets lost in a lot of the other you know, higher profile debates we have, um, but it's really, really important. Um, we've also been able to find out, I worked on a bipartisan bill with Tom Tillis uh, that passed last year for the, which really established a task force which is setting maternal mental health policy uh, in the country for the first time. That task force got up and running uh, this fall. Um, and what we're really looking to do, of course, is make sure that we understand maternal mental health, uh, both um, before birth and after, uh, and uh, really help uh, new families make sure that they stay strong in what can be a really vulnerable time. So um, it's really exciting work. Bill, you, you should talk more about it because you're the doc. Well, you know, there's a wonderful scripture, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Sometimes in public policy, but in life, we should imagine ourselves in the situation of another. Uh, and we always have to avoid the easy temptation to, uh, here's, a, here's 10 bucks, um, because that's just a, a momentary solution, sometimes important. But it's more important to kind of go to the structural issue. So, so my practice when I was in Louisiana was in a public hospital for the uninsured in a kind of depressed area of town. Uh, so I could imagine you are the single mom, and you are 19 years old, and you're pregnant, and you're at risk for preeclampsia. The doc is monitoring your blood pressure. It is August, and you're eight and a half months pregnant, and you've got to take public transportation to see the uh, obstetrician. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Now, by the way, going back to if you just think second and third degree, um, if you look at per cost per patient, um, Children in the NICU are among the most expensive. Like the top three or four diagnoses are all related yeah. to neonates. Now, some of it's congenital. <clears throat> but some of it is the mom has a hard time. The baby's more likely to end up in the NICU. Yeah. So, so what I'm creating here is both an immediate, we're going to help you. You don't, go have, to, you don't have to stand at the, the bus, which is a half an hour late, to go across town when you're eight and a half months pregnant, to the macro in which if we do the right thing for her, we do the right thing for us all. Right. Uh, and so with this, with the remote monitoring, uh, oh, my gosh, the blood pressure is up. Um, it's not because she just took a bus and we don't know whether to believe it or not. It's because she's at home, she's resting, and her blood pressure is up. Uh, you can teach her how to check her urine for, for protein, so you can check other things that are important. Now, let's send a home health nurse to her. Right. And if you do that, a little bit more expense on the front end, you save a heck of a lot on the back end. Right. And you do the right thing for her. So I do think that enlightened public policy is able to defend itself both for what we're doing in the immediacy, but also what we're doing globally. Yeah. Uh, one more time, game theory. When everyone does well, everyone else does better. Yeah. It's a really good transition into <clears throat> the, the next phase of you know, a mother or a parent's life. You've both been incredible leaders uh, in, in these bipartisan discussions about paid family medical leave. The House recently launched a working group that's bipartisan. Many people in this room helped, <clears throat> helped develop that. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, Senator Cassidy, you've been really important for, for Republican senators in helping them figure out how to, how to talk about this. Uh, where do you see this conversation going? Well, Maggie's going. No, you, you go first. Maggie's going to have a lot to say. Uh, uh, but um, uh, so um, we're boomers. Uh, if you haven't noticed, um, so-called sandwich generation. Uh, we all have personal stories of parents 
uh, who required an incredible um, stay-at-home care, and some of us have stories of those for those beneath, beneath us. Uh, and so it's a real thing, and there's nothing like uh, reality to to wake a legislator up to the fact that there's a need in society. Uh, and so certainly it's a reality in my family. Uh, so, um, so I think that how you pay for it is now another issue. Right. Uh, if you can't pay for something, and there's a nun back home, she goes without margin. There is no mission. Uh, right. And of course, she was speaking of running a hospital, but you can kind of think of that in government. If something is too expensive that you just can't get there, then so the question is, how do we get there? So, so Kirsten Cinema and I uh, have been working on something for parents when they adopt or when they have a child to give the mom and the dad the option to stay at home and, and be with the child or to go back to work and income, um, go back to work and hire somebody to care for their child, giving the parent the ability. But there's a whole spectrum. And I think what we're going to require is for uh, both parties to come together and find out what we can all live with, how can we pay for it, um, in a way which is good for the family, and then we can defend as being good for all society. But Maggie has so much to say on this. You go, Maggie. <laughs> well, Bill has been an extraordinary leader on this, and I think what I would start with is um, when I first started talking about this issue when I was in the state senate, I hate to say how many years ago that was, uh, and then as governor, it was really a discussion that mostly Democrats had. Um, and now what we see is um, Republicans uh, and Democrats and independents, all of whom not only have uh, constituents who are talking to them about this, but we all have our own life experience. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of, uh, our son just had a hospitalization a little while ago. My mom just had a hospitalization. My sister's taking this week off from work, right? So um, that's the reality of our lives. And I think people are increasingly understanding how important paid leave is and how, um, the disparities are working in the paid leave space. You know, when I was a lawyer in a big firm, there was paid leave for me. This is now 25, 30 years ago, right? Um, but when you are a worker on the front lines at Amazon, for instance, you may not have that kind of access to paid leave. So we do um, now have increased agreement that this is an issue that we need to address. To Bill's point, the real disagreement comes down to how do you pay for it? We've got um, Kirsten and Bill's um, legislation, um, uh, there's a bill uh, that I'm also supporting that looks on how to take away certain barriers in the FMLA to even unpaid leave. You know, if a couple works for the same employer, they don't get the same number of weeks as if they worked for separate employers. That's a fix we can make uh, that, that is fairly straightforward. Um, but there's going to be a, a lot more work to do here. Uh, we're also trying to get, and I'm just mentioning this because I'm sitting next to my colleague and it's not finished yet. Uh, right now, reservists and members of the National Guard don't get the same parental leave uh, policy as active duty folks do. So they can only, moms in the National Guard and Reserve can get leave for the birth of a child, but adoption, foster care, and dads don't get it when our active duty does. So that's another thing we can take care of. But the bigger discussion really has to be what kind of investment do we need to make as a country? How do we make that investment uh, to really move forward on this issue? Uh, because caregiving is so critically important. The last thing I'll say is that um, we might not need as much paid leave or just protected leave as we currently do um, if we had a home health care system uh, that was functional and we respected caregiving as the profession that it is. Um, I am able to do what I do because our 35-year-old son has had the same anchor caregiver for 34 years. He lives at home with us. She shows up at our house at 5 o'clock every morning, um, and she is creative, strong, wonderful, helped us raise our daughter, too. Um, we need to recognize caregiving for um, the profession that it is. We need to empower people to make family-sustaining careers out of it. And that will, of course, cost re resources. But to Bill's earlier point, on the other end of that, uh, the money you save, the stability you create, uh, the quality of life you create uh, is really the cornerstone pros to prosperity for everybody. Thankfully, you know, there's um, lots of polling that shows that folks understand that there needs yeah. to be compromise on it. Uh, similarly, 
lots of polling showing that people want some sort of compromise on a hotter ticket item that uh, uh, be loath not to ask. Uh, the child tax credits expansion uh, is, is always in discussion uh, potentially for a compromise um, whenever there's a window. Yeah. Senator Hassan, you've been really leading efforts on making sure that there is a window. Uh, regardless of what that looks like, I'd be curious where you see the debate going. Well, so, um, and, and I will want Bill to, to chime in on this too. We obviously know the value of the child tax credit uh, in fighting poverty, and uh, we also know the impact of poverty on kids um, and how important it is for us to address that. And again, how much money uh, we would all save and how much stronger our society would be and how much better the quality of individual children's and adults' lives would be if we really dealt with childhood poverty uh, more effectively. Um, so. Um, I've been looking at uh, ways we can really um, target an expansion of the child tax credit in a bipartisan way to incentivize work but also really help address childhood poverty. Uh, at the same time, for a long time, I've also been trying to address um, a change that was made in the 2017 tax law to the deductibility of research and development um, expenses for businesses. Um, I believe that uh, tax credits or deductions for innovation are really one of the ways we should be um, making policy, uh, really helping these innovation-based businesses afford the research and development that drives the American economy and our leadership. And so um, we are focusing on ways we can change the R&D deduction back to what it was, which was you could deduct your entire expense in the first year. Um, but this also gives us an opportunity, if we're going to change that policy, uh, to pair it with a targeted change to the child tax credit. So we're looking at, uh, for instance, phasing in the child tax credit at the first dollar of earnings um, as opposed to uh, what it is now. For, you, you don't get any child tax credit till you've earned $2,500. Um, and we're um, ha having good bipartisan discussions on it. I'm pleased to be working with Senator Young um, on it. And uh, we're hoping that if there's a January bill uh, that has some tax provisions that we might be able to get there. Uh, we've got members of both parties really focused on it. Yeah, and just to add, just to present the challenges, the to, to renew the uh, child tax credit as, as Senator Wyden wishes to renew is $1.4 trillion over 10 years. And the uh, R&D tax credit, which Maggie, I think, is like $18 billion over 10 years. It, it's... Well, we're looking at $97 billion for business tax changes. We're looking at trying to do a much more targeted CTC provision. Yeah. So anyway, you, you got to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, uh, and so you got to, you got to figure out how to do that. Uh, and, and if for no other reason, the house does not want more mandatory spending, they're, they're probably a little bit more inclined to have tax expenditures, but still the fact is it still adds up. And at some point you got to pay the bill. Um, I think that the millennials, uh, and uh, Gen Z are a little resentful of the fact that boomers continue to kind of soak up all these dollars. Uh, and so we, you, you, do, you do want to have a rationale for whatever you do in a way which uh, uh, passes on our country financially yeah. well. So, uh, <clears throat> On an even more macro level, we have time for you know, one substantive question uh, <clears throat> for you, Senator Cassidy. On a very macro level, you've been leading efforts publicly on, on Social Security. Uh, I'd be curious how you see those that, that work impacting families, households. Well, um, if Social Security goes insolvent, as it's scheduled to do per the actuaries and CBO in eight to nine years, there'll be a 24% cut in benefits for those who are currently receiving Social. Now, that will double the rate of poverty among the elderly. Uh, and that will be foisted upon either the person will live in poverty or their upkeep will be foisted upon the generation behind them. So we should be uh, doing everything we can to avoid this 24% cut in benefits. Um, and you would think we were, but so far it's not happening. Um, so I've been working with a bipartisan group of senators. Uh, last Congress there was 14 of us, 7 and 7. And we'd come up with a plan which actually addressed it. Uh, which, and not only did it prevent the 24% cut, but it also repealed something called Weapon GPO, which is something which adversely affects non-federal public employees in about 16 states uh, really heavily. Um, we actually have work incentives. 
Right now, if somebody is 65 years old and she chooses to continue to work, and she's getting her social, but she chooses to continue to work, she'll get as much as $1,000 a month penalty on her Social Security payment. So she chooses not to work. Uh, so she's hurting herself financially, but it makes sense. Now, theoretically, she gets it on the back end, but there's a racial effect here because people who are lower income, lowest fifth quintile, which is disproportionately people of color, are less likely to live long enough to get it all back. And so uh, Lindsey Graham calls Social Security a transfer between black men who die young and uh, uh, white women who tend to live a long time. That's kind of like not where we should be doing it. And so we can do a work incentive, which kind of creates that, uh, corrects that imbalance. Um, and we also, in our provision, have what is called a poverty alleviation provision. Uh, I, I relate this. My, my mother had a domestic when I was a child, and she worked a half a day a week for um, 10 different people. Uh, so my mom would take her down the street, and she'd work for Miss Smith, and the next day she'd work for Miss Jones, and the next day. My mother, I think, was the only one that paid Social Security for her. Mm -hmm. And everybody else, because the, the domestic wanted it, paid cash. She didn't want to have any money withheld. My mother said, no, it's a law, number one, and number two, you're going to appreciate it when you're older. On the payrolls, on Social Security, she's got her quarters, but it looks like she worked very little. And, her, and the amount that she's receiving is very little. Uh, what we do is we create a minimum benefit, effectively, so that everybody gets a certain amount of money. The actuaries say that our program will be the greatest uh, poverty alleviation program for the elderly since Social Security was originally passed. Um, and did I say we don't raise tax rates? Uh, so um, you would think that this would be something that everybody would be clamoring to do. Uh, but both Biden and Trump are going to try and run for election telling the American people either that there is no problem with Social Security or the solution that the, that's the case of Trump or the case of Biden is that the solution he's proposing everybody knows won't work. In fact, I had my... 14 of us, and Biden, we walked out of Biden's State of the Union speech after he went after Republicans, and my Democratic colleague said, our proposal's dead. He is going to run against Republicans attacking you on Social Security, which means that we can no longer work with you. Now, sometimes you work hard um, and you put together a bipartisan solution which appeals across the spectrum of all the trade-offs you have to do to get there, and politics intervenes. Uh, it's incredibly disappointing. I think it's incredibly irresponsible of Biden and Trump. Uh, but that's the politics, and that's why we need your help. Uh, we need your help to make sure that these issues are raised in a positive way so that Republicans and Democrats don't get away by demagoguing an issue, uh, misleading the American people as to uh, potential solutions, but instead are forced to come to the table with something which benefits individuals and benefits families and, by the way, benefits us all. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's um, a, a perfect closing, but, you know, as we do close, uh, Senator Hassan, maybe you could, you know, broaden it out on, on all these issues, you know. Uh, How can we do this? How can we work together? <laughs> well, look, the American people work together every day. The people of New Hampshire work together every day. I have constituents who show up and work, and they don't say, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Before we get through this work day, they come to work and they solve problems. They do it in their communities and their families, too. Um, New Hampshire also has this great town meeting culture, you know, 400 House members for 1.4 million people. Uh, everybody gets a chance to speak, but everybody has a responsibility to build consensus, too. And um, that's what bipartisanship is about. That's what our Constitution and yeah, what I call our mission statement, which is the Declaration, uh, really do require of us. And there are lots of uh, um, examples of bipartisan work going on in Congress. What we need from um, all of you is something you all already do, but it is advocacy from real people who talk about their lives. Um, one of the things we haven't mentioned about today, we've touched on mental health a little bit, which is probably the number one thing I hear about from young people right now, um, like grade school kids who say to me, Senator, what are you doing about mental health, um, is the opioid epidemic. 
We have made, um, you know, I'm hoping, I think we're having a hearing next week on the Support Act, on reauthorizing the Support Act, uh, which was a game changer uh, and really lays the foundation for a lot of the work we still need to do in this space. But the reason we've made any progress here, the reason we passed the MAT Act, the reason uh, we are building infrastructure for uh, recovery services is because people with addiction and their families spoke up and demanded that we stop stigmatizing a whole part of the population, just as mental health advocates are demanding that we stop stigmatizing them. When people stand up and say, we matter and we count and this is what our lives are like, then the democracy can and does respond, sometimes in a painstakingly slow and uneven way. Um, but I think what I would close with this morning, besides a huge thank you for the work that all of you do, is um, really to echo Bill a little bit in a slightly different way. Um, democracy has to exist for us to be able to make progress on these issues. And I don't mean to be too dramatic about this, except that I do think democracy is being challenged and our democracy as a system is at risk. If we do not have elected officials who believe they are accountable to people, who believe that the next election matters and will follow election results, we will not have the opportunity to make progress on these issues that matter to the most marginalized people in our nation. And so, you know, former President Trump came to New Hampshire about three weeks ago, and in a speech at Clare in Claremont, New Hampshire, a small old mill town that is revitalizing, but that has some of the biggest challenges in my state, and refers to his political opponents as vermin and says we should crush them, echoes of what um, authoritarians and dictators have said in the past. If we do not take this seriously and if we do not unite around the concept of democracy as the best form of government to do exactly what Bill's talking about, which is to make sure everybody does better because everybody's doing better. You sounded like Paul Wellstone, but I didn't want to say it. Um, but, but that really is what's at stake over the next year. So please keep advocating on the policy issues that are so important to so many of us. Please take from this morning that there is bipartisan agreement that we all do better when we all do better, um, but that we have to find ways to pay for things and to be responsible in the way we do it. Um, but at the end of the day, please also take from this morning that without a democracy, making progress on this um, gets much, much harder, if possible, at all. So I thank you all for being part of this process. I thank you all for caring about our country and our communities um, and some of the most marginalized people and recognizing that as we address these issues, we will make our country stronger and our prosperity greater, and we will continue to lead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, go forth into your days and do the good work. And we know everybody here will be wishing and praying and supporting and, and knowing you'll do a good work, knowing that you have a room full of people that uh, deeply want you to succeed. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Please follow. Yeah. Thank you. OK, now I have the great pleasure of introducing Adrian Schwer from Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I'll let her introduce the next panel, but I just want to say that uh, everybody knows Adrian. Uh, she's a fierce uh, leader of, uh, of folks and advocates on a bunch of different issues. So um, please join me in thanking fierce her. Fierce's true leader is questionable. <laughs> yes, but thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. If I can have all my panelists join, I'm going to quickly walk through. Um, for everyone in the room, many of our uh, panelists um, uh, I could spend the entire time we have together introducing them. So Indy. Please join me here. This is the President Executive Director of CLASC, Luke Follow right behind, professor of, professor of Social Justice and Social Policy at the University of Michigan. Jaron Smith, partner at Denton's and former um, Assistant uh, Secretary at the Domestic Policy Council for the President. And Abby McCloskey, columnist um, and founder of McCloskey Policy. So I'm super excited to have this panel here today because I think we have a um, diverse set of perspectives, a ideologically diverse set of perspectives, and people who genuinely care and have built portions of their lives around um, thriving families and reducing poverty and improving the lives of people in our country. 
So I'm going to challenge everybody with a couple questions to kind of kick us off. And I'm going to move pretty fast because our time, we have about a half hour and I want to be respectful of all of your time. And I want you to ask questions too. So let's jump right in with one question for each. And um, Luke, let me start with you. Um, you have been doing, well, first, I'd love to see where you think there's bipartisan potential and issues that would help families. And I'll walk through a few that I think each of you can start. But Luke, why don't you get us kicked off um, on some of the things that you see bipartisan potential in? Sure. Well, it was incredibly exciting. What a great um, example of two policymakers in conversation with another, each other and in, in finding common ground. Um, of course, uh, the thing I love most in my heart is the uh, child tax credit, and so it's wonderful to hear that uh, some conversation about uh, expansion of that being on the table. Uh, we don't have to wonder what would happen if we expanded the child tax credit. Probably all of us are familiar with the incredible poverty reductions. Um, just to list a few of the other impacts, we saw food hardship among families with children uh, fall to the lowest level ever recorded, first time it ever dipped below other families. Uh, we saw credit scores actually hit their all-time high at the end of 2021, the, the fewest Americans with bad credit at the end of 2021. Bank account balances had much more given them. So um, I think just an incredible uh, set of factors uh, that can be put into conversation about how we move forward with a policy like this. Uh, of course, the single most important element of that to me uh, from a, from a um, policy analysis standpoint is full refundability, that it doesn't start to phase in with dollar one, but that we keep it simple stupid, as it's often said, uh, using the KISS principle and say, let's have a standard amount. It's simple to understand. Um, and it has the most impact for the poorest families, which, of course, from my own research is what I care the most about. I think has the most impact of... of um, getting the most benefit dollars to states like Louisiana. And so uh, I look forward to seeing where that conversation goes. Uh, I think there's a lot of room to have a positive movement there. And again, uh, we have the evidence. We see what's possible. And now it's a matter of deciding what we want to do as a nation and figuring out how we pay for it. Very cool. Abby, I'm going to turn it to you. You have been convening people from across the ideological perspective in a very deep, wonky complicated way. Why don't you talk about what you've been learning from your program? Thanks, Adrian, and thank you all for being here. Our report is not out yet, so as much as I want to steal our thunder, I won't. <laughs> um, but over the last year, we've had a group of 32 leaders in family policy from all across the political spectrum meeting monthly to talk about the issues we're talking about this morning. And it's a charged topic in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision and Build Back Better. And a lot of us continue to see the world extremely differently. But there is hope for reform in these discussions. So Luke mentioned the CTC, as did the senators. Uh, an additional wrinkle or opportunity in there that I would add is increasing the flexibility of the existing credit, that if a family can claim the full credit, which is a subject of good debate, that's $34,000 when their child is between the ages of 0 and 17. That's a lot of money. There's a lot of possibilities of how that money could be used, including giving families the option of being able to pull more of that forward, as Senator, Senator Cassidy and Cinema and others have proposed. In the paid leave space, which we touched on, there's recognition that paid leave for new parents is likely the most bipartisan path forward. It's a unique time of brain development, of healing, of bonding and attachment within the family. Um, so there's a lot of hope for reform in that space, especially with the working groups in the House and the Senate side. We have talked about childcare, and that has been an area of more difference. I'm looking at Indy and Adrian because they're part of this group. Um, I think it's fair to say that most people believe that working through CCDBG and the existing system is probably the most likely way to increase childcare support for low to moderate income households. It preserves differences across states, parental preferences for care. Um, but we've had a lot of discussions about how to also increase parental care and the ability for parents to care for their own children, which goes into our workplace culture and a bunch of other issues. And the last thing I'll mention, which I was so glad the Senator, um, Senator Cassidy said at the end, is the energy in our group and others like it. There was an AI Brookings working group a few years ago that talked about the increase to, um, or the need to increase intergenerational equity in our budget. 
and that the budget is a can that keeps getting kicked down the road. Eventually it won't be. And when we have the big discussions about how we're prioritizing our spending, ideally there are bipartisan plans to orient more of it towards the early years of life, which we've chronically underinvested in. So that gives you a flavor of what we're, what we're talking about. It's a lot, Abby. It is a lot. It's a wide spectrum of issues. Um, Andy, I want to turn to you because your work at CLASP and your work for the last 20 years has been on a lot of the things Abby mentioned, but it's also been broader outside of what we just talked about, or if you want to riff on that too, where do you see the potential? Well, th thanks, Adrian. <clears throat> and yeah, a lot, lot has been um, covered. Um, I, I used to say I love the child tax credit uh, almost as much as I love my own kids. Um, and Luke, <laughs> we may have to have a, you know, a thumb or something over who loves that more. And I think um, there, I, I want to I say that there are a couple of areas of potential progress, but I also want to make some broader points about this whole endeavor. Um, so I think mental health, we heard a lot about that earlier. There's clear need and understanding about some of the solutions uh, across the ideological spectrum, across the partisan spectrum as well. And I think whether it's maternal me mental health, adolescent youth mental health, um, or uh, beyond, uh, I think there's lots of energy there and potential. And we have a track record of progress. Senate Finance Committee last year, again this year, they've marked up a bill. Um, and this actually brings me to a broader point. I work for a group that is focused on transformative change. When we look at the world out there and we look at what families need, we see a huge mismatch. And we want transformative change. And we often think of ourselves as fighters. We're fighting for things, right? So sometimes it can be hard then to say, oh, well, now I'm going to compromise. But to me, when we get back to what Senator Hassan said about defending democracy and protecting our democracy, compromise is fundamental. Uh, at the end of the day, you can achieve transformative change. It may take longer than we'd like. It may take decades. But compromise and getting things done can actually help lay the groundwork. When you think about how we have made progress on paid family and medical leave, we've started expanding it a bit. Military, federal employees, some states have done it. None of those things were the big thing that some of us who advocate for paid family and medical leave wanted as the answer. But all those things can help us and in fundamentally, meanwhile, help families. That, I think, has also some feedback effect. If people believe that our democracy can deliver and they see it and we talk about it and they understand that, that itself might be protective of our democracy. So there's a whole range of issues um, on childcare. I actually think that there can be a lot of bipartisan agreement just for boosting funding. We're facing a $16 billion sort of shortfall right now. And we have consistently funded childcare and expanded it in recent years on a bipartisan basis. That doesn't mean that me, my group, can't also go push for our sort of bill that we think is the answer to the problems. Um, but we can't always wait for that solution. If you're involved in policymaking and you're waiting for your perfect answer and your perfect solution, in my apparently 20 years of doing this work, um, that you're in the wrong line of business. Old man. Yes, <laughs> you're in the wrong line of business. Because I think the reality of policymaking is that people urgently need help. And yes, that will often fall short from my perspective, from my organization's perspective. But it can lay a foundation that we can build on. You just made my bipartisan heart sing. Um, Jaron, I saved you for last for an important reason. The last, the, the last set of speakers we had talked about the former president in a way that didn't paint it great. But when you served in the administration, you achieved some pretty transformative things, from opportunity zones to doubling CCGDB to laying the groundwork for the first paid leave, like big deals in the grand sweeping uh, world here um, that have helped a lot of families. And you just finished writing a book that I'd love you to tell everybody about. And I also want to hear, you know, we have an election next year. We could see a very different uh, set of stakeholders in the uh, bodies of change. Like, what do you think we should be thinking about? And what did you think about when you entered a new administration at a new time and took advantage of the opportunities that existed? Sure. So um, thank you for all um, inviting me to this uh, important panel. You know, um, 
I always look at life as as paradoxes. You know, uh, folks. You know, as polarizing as Trump was, he he did do a lot of work that created some bipartisan atmosphere, which is um, the reason why I wrote the book Underserved because there is um, a, a way to kind of get big change done, um, even in the worst atmospheres. And um, and I was able to um, experience that, um, being able to work with leaders like Van Jones or Cory Booker or Bob Johnson. Um, as well as like Secretary Carson and or, or Linda McMahon, um, all who endorsed the book, or even like a rapper like Ice Cube, you know, what would he have to do working with the Trump administration? Um, I think that as you look at these issues um, that that are affecting Americans, you know, um, I think you have to look at them um, holistically. Um, a lot of issues feed into each other. Um, I mean, we're talking a lot about paid family leave. You know, um, and work supports, you know, like uh, child care um, and things as you're trying to get started. Um, but then once you get started, then you have to worry about education for the kid, you know, um, um, the mental health of the parent um, going through the anguish of, of raising a kid um, or crime in the community. What type of community or environment are you raising the kid in? And you have those environmental supports. Um, uh, I, I just saw the Biden administration put out a report on the social determinants of health. Um, I think we need to look at all the, the, the issues that, that go into mental health. Um, and we also have to realize that we're looking at a system that's needed um, historic change for like 40 or 50 years. Um, so you're looking at um, great grandparents that are, are living with emotional trauma um, um, and parents who are picking up the baggage from that emotional trauma from their grandparents and then also giving that out to the, to the children today. I mean, you look at the crime rates here in uh, Washington, D.C., um, a lot of it is being contributed by, by children. And so um, in the book, what I, what I talk about is the methodology that I think undergirds um, a lot of this um, is, one, being intentional. Um, you, you have to kind of think with the end in mind. Um, and what outcomes you want to create. But number two, which is probably the most important thing, is creating trust. Um, you can't have any type of public debate um, about these important issues if you can't have an honest discussion about what are the issues. And um, you know, when you use words like compromise, and I, and I know we need that, you know, it pushes people away because no one wants to compromise. I didn't, I didn't come to Washington to compromise. But there is a way to find common ground. There are areas where you know, our constituencies care about the same thing. Um, for example, if you break up impoverished communities throughout the country, a third are black, a third are white, and a third are Hispanic. You know, so there's obviously two caucuses that represent that. That's the RSC, that's the um, uh, three caucuses, the Hispanic caucus, and also the um, Congressional Black Caucus. With those three caucuses, you can do a lot of change. Um, but we've talked a lot about pay-fors, right? Um, how come we can't do an audit of all the programs that affect underserved communities and figure out where we need to modernize, um, where we need to cut, you know, and where we need to make investment in? Because um, there's a lot of money that we can figure out how to get those paid for us for the things that would modernize our government and make it easier for all Americans to achieve the American dream. And so in the book, Underserved, that's what we talk about by talking about the history um, of how we got to where we are and then developing solutions um, by building on trust, um, creating the right uh, um, partnerships and delivering outcomes that we can study and make better informed decisions when it comes to our public policy. Very interesting. And as you're speaking, two things popped in my mind that I think have been historically true in public policy, but have broken in the last couple of years. So one, many of us who study policy or advocate on them have been told, once a benefit exists, you can never claw it back. Mm -hmm. Well, CTC, monthly payments, just proved to us for the first time that at a macro level, our government can get to a place where it doesn't have the political pressure to maintain a, an existing program. I think that's a very interesting change in policy and could have a lot of cascading effects um, to policymakers' view. And then the other is, in my work on paid leave, when I first entered this issue, there was a lot of conversation of we only get one bite at the apple. Now, if we get anything paid leave at the federal level, we'll never get another bite at the apple. And we've had three pretty solid ones between pandemic, tax credit, and federal workers, and there's going to be more. So I think that like foundational principle is changed a little bit on these policies too. And I hope people will be thinking about that as we try and look forward and, and leverage those uh, tailwinds or, or new realities. Um, I'm going to open up for questions in three minutes. So if we have someone who's going to help us organize that, that would be great. And otherwise, I have two last ones. Um, Luke and Jerome, 
you guys have done a lot of work thinking about communities and place-based solutions, less of one single pol federal policy and everybody follow this. What do you think this room needs to be thinking about as they're um, adding the lens of communities, unique environments, uh, unique needs? In terms of being here in Washington, uh, in my uh, new book, The Injustice of Place, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to identify the most disadvantaged communities in the country based on poverty, health, and social mobility. And it really drew us to uh, rural communities, many rural communities in the South. And, and just um, as was mentioned, uh, these are very, very poor white communities, very, very poor communities of black Americans, and very, very poor Hispanic communities. Uh, rural communities are at a competitive disadvantage to draw down many of the resources from the federal government. Uh, one of the single best uh, indicators, uh, variables in predicting how many federal dollars come down from block grants or what have you is the number of grant writers in communities. And so because of a lack of capacity and also a lot of time matching requirements uh, really leave out very, very poor rural communities and that's where some of our very deepest need is. So there is a lot of little stuff that can be done here in Washington to level the playing field and get more dollars to very poor communities. Another thing is just following the innovation that's going on. So right now, the thing I'm most excited about in my work life is a program called RX Kids in Flint, Michigan, uh, where starting in January, every <coughs> expectant mom will receive $1,500 in the second or third trimester, and then $500 a month until their baby turns one. So this isn't a pilot. This isn't like 100 families. This is every family in the city of Flint. We're going to eliminate deep poverty in the city of Flint. It's evidence-based in terms of building on the child tax credit, but adding this prenatal period, the evidence is really, really strong that supporting expectant moms during that prenatal period can have a huge impact on uh, health disparities for mom, as well as kids throughout the life trajectory. There's tons of evidence that we can impact child welfare involvement in that first year with uh, cash transfers as well. And it's only possible for us to do this because of a partnership with the state of Michigan where we're going to be drawing down TANF dollars and partial support in combination with philanthropic sources. So I happen to think this is the coolest thing going around right now. Uh, uh, but there's so much innovation going on across the country. So bringing together uh, more sources to learn about those, uh, figure out how we can draw from each other uh, is a part of the excitement right now. So uh, when I was in the administration, um, one of my uh, uh, biggest achievements, at least at least for me, was being able to kind of build on uh, uh, work that was originally started by Jack Kemp um, when he created Enterprise Zones, um, later built upon by uh, President Obama with Promise Zones, and then uh, lastly, uh, um, being able to uh, leverage Opportunity Zones. Um, from all of that history, you know, um, you had one approach that um, leaned on the private sector, another approach that leaned on the government, um, but the approach we took was being able to leverage both. Um, and I think that when we're talking about um, underserved communities, we need an all above approach, which is why um, the book Underserved Harnessing Lincoln's Principles for Reconstruction for Today's Forgotten Communities is just a way to talk about a Marshall Plan um, without scaring people out by saying the word Marshall Plan that are on the right. <laughs> um, but you need to have that type of vision um, um, to create a, a infrastructure of opportunity that's going to um, be able to have a ground up approach to look at the um, dynamics that are um, hitting communities today. And through that council, we were able to set up a number of working groups, which we have um, built upon. You know, we had a. Um, we need to have um, solutions as it relates to economic development and affordability. You know, entrepreneurship and wealth building. You know, um, education, um, jobs, and uh, opportunity. And then, lastly, and, and, and very importantly, um, uh, 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 public safety and uh, behavioral health, um, or or fam uh, our policy around family. You know, um, the dynamic around resiliency is is one of the most important things in the American fabric. Um, unfortunately, so many people have experienced so much mass trauma. Um, addiction, that once they fall down, it's hard for them to get back up. And there's really no infrastructure of opportunity on the ground. And so being able to uh, reevaluate um, what that infrastructure looks like by bringing something back that's also a part of the American uh, fabric, which is civil society, you know, strong civil society, strong churches, nonprofits, um, being able to kind of um, lift your brother up. You know, um, um, as much as I, I know there's a role for government, you know, when it's dealing with the issues of the heart, you know, we need something that's um, uh, that, that's that's going to really transcend 
you know, um, experience. And we've seen that. Um, but how do you scale that? How do you scale social entrepreneurship? How do we modernize that? Like, uh, you know, the senators were talking about um, having uh, workers or, or domestic in the house. You know, um, that, that's an important job, uh, a very important job, as much as uh, teachers, you know, or, or ment uh, mentors. You know, um, and we need to kind of create and invest in those infrastructures. And, you know, federally or state or local, we have, you know, uh, uh, carrots and sticks that may be able to incentivize the right matchmaking. Um, we have a lot of philanthropic dollars um, going into this. This, this work, but how do we uh, coordinate together, you know, to create a robust plan that's flexible enough to think about the nuances of the, and the diversity of the communities around the country. And so um, that's something that I'm advocating, and it, there's no right or wrong, but I think we need to create the right data sets to figure out how do we um, study those outcomes and, uh, and make the right investments so that we can create opportunity right now helpful from both sides. Let me open it up. Do we have any questions from the audience? I see one in the back. How good are you at projecting? Or is there a microphone? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, David Jimenez with the Niskanen Center. There was a lot of discussion in the first half on the issue of uh, helping Americans who are struggling with uh, disabilities. And one bill we're working on with uh, CLASP is removing some of the barriers to marriage, work, and savings in the Supplemental Security Income Program that uh, Cassidy is spearheading with Senator Brown. So if you could speak to that great bill. Yes, thank you, uh, David. Um, <laughs> that was like not teed oh, up. Man. Not teed Whoa. up. Uh, first time I'm meeting David in person, sort of. Um, uh, and a uh, shout out to my colleague Ashley Burnside, who helps lead our work here on that. Um, and no, it's, it's a really great example. Here we have a asset limit in the supplemental security um, income program, which is essentially a program of last resort uh, for people with disabilities, people who are blind, people who are aged. Um, often they're not going to qualify for other benefits. And uh, we say, uh, David or Ashley will correct me if I get this wrong, but if you're living on your own, you have a $2,000 asset limit, 3000 if you're married. Um, uh, and a fact checker say that's correct. So um, that has been stagnant for decades. Um, over 30 years, um, <laughs> uh, the life of an ED. Um, OK, so uh, he, here's a great example. Jaron just talked about incentives. What kind of incentives does that create? When anyone, look, I believe in the strongest safety net. I like to think of it as a foundation that allows people to access and take advantage of opportunity. And if anyone in this country faces a crisis, like the car breaks down, which is a very common crisis, and in most of America, you need a car, what is the first thing you're going to want to do? You're not going to want to, want to go apply for benefits. You're going to want to just take a little bit of money, $500, $750, whatever you need out of your bank account. So think about what incentives this creates, both on the marriage side, it's $1,000 if you're married, right? And on the side of building up some potential savings that could also help you maybe have better housing, um, maybe live in a situation where you can even help with caregiving for a grandchild. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. So we are genuinely hindering people's freedom here. This was actually something that from the beginning on a bipartisan basis has been worked on. We're making enormous progress. Um, I, I would guess uh, with the very blurry crystal ball that I have, that this is something we can get done in, in the next couple of Congresses. We have support from, David didn't uh, mention his organization, from the Niskanen Center, um, lots of groups working um, who uh, either have a libertarian or conservative bent, certainly groups like CLASP, which is social justice focus, is working on it. And it's a perfect example of, I also think, the, we talk a lot about lived experience. I do just want to note this. Do, sometimes people sort of say, oh, lived experience, what does that even mean? Why are you bring that up? Did you, if you notice the two senators here, they repeatedly talked about their life experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly. So everyone's lived experience matters. We can either accept that and lift it up and show that that is, a, that is expertise. That is a meaningful form of expertise. Or we can pretend that it only matters for some. But everyone's life experiences matters, and it gives them some meaningful expertise. And so when you talk to people who are actually participating in the SSI program, for example, you see 
how constraining this is and how much it limits their basic ability to function and contribute and live their life to the fullest. So one other just sort of final point I wanted to know. I will. I'll keep going. (laughs) If you take all the quotes that you have heard here and just didn't attribute them to anyone, especially from the senators before, but even here, I would venture to guess you'd have a tough time with about 75% of them guessing, was it someone from the left or someone from the right? Mm -hmm. And research shows this consistently. We misunderstand the other side's views. Why is that? I don't think our news environment helps. We hear a lot of the extremists, right? And we consistently misunderstand what another side believes. I have a dear friend of mine, uh, Jason Fickner, conservative, worked at the Mercatus Center, BPC. Now, um, we decided we're going to write an op-ed together on the earned income tax credit. He drafted it, and he wrote it in both of our voices, and I was taken aback at how awful my view sounded in his voice. (laughs) I was like, you think I believe these things? And it just sort of underscored this very problem. And we were friends, and I thought we understood each other, so we're writing an op-ed together. And it was just wildly off from what I actually believe. So that's something to keep in mind. It's worth starting the conversation, because you don't necessarily really know what someone else believes. As I come to a close, and I really want to invite you to come up and join us and close this out because we'll all benefit from hearing from her. I think my greatest learning from this, and I hope yours too, is that there's a lot happening here on Capitol Hill and across this ecosystem that has the potential for massive change, and it might seem small, but I challenge Spotlight on Poverty to really figure out a way to get this whole group, everybody in the audience, everyone who's spoken, Um, into some type of a distribution mechanism so that we can help bills like this and help connected moms and some of the other things that only go out in a senator's press release get passed soon. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, panel, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, well, in addition to thanking the senators and our fabulous panelists, um, I get the pleasure of thanking some of the folks who were able to pull this event together. Uh, The three co-leads of the event, uh, I want to start with Shelley Waters Boots, who is a senior advisor to Spotlight, uh, Bill Nichols of Freeman Consulting, and Michael Mershon at the Hatcher Group, who was not only organizing this event, but delivering chairs and putting coffee cups out there for renewal. Um, Special thanks to Paolo and the American Policy Ventures team, including Connor Murphy and Liam DeClive Lowe. Um, They're great teams, including Eris uh, Donaldson, Victoria Kane, Izzy Russell, and Chelsea Hall. Um, Issues like the ones that the panelists and the senators discussed today, including the CTC, child care, are important to us at the Doris Duke Foundation because we believe they are at the heart of the prevention agenda. Each year, millions of children are called into abuse and neglect hotlines, not because of abuse, but because as Senator Hassan said, um, they are struggling to make life work. Um, Often the issues that they face are material hardship, um, as well as the lack of social supports. And at DDF, we believe that these conversations are essential to moving the prevention paradigm forward that Sam talked about. And we want to make sure that um, as we talk about child abuse prevention being really an early childhood and family support issue, that we keep the most vulnerable children at the center of these debates. Uh, So thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to um, reconvening some some group like this in the new year to, to give you more details about our exciting prevention demonstration. Thanks so much, everyone.